This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 1022, recorded on July 6, 2023. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses, Joining me today from New York, Daniel Griffin. Hello, everyone. So, Daniel, we're in the heart of the summer here, and there's not much influenza. There's not much rhinovirus. Is there not much COVID also? There's a little background COVID, and I have a few patients in the hospital that I'm taking care of with COVID. I had a couple of folks uh, mm-hmm. when I was just recently at Columbia. So it's at sort of that low background level at the moment. Is it the same? W- would you also see a few flu patients uh, as well, respiratory syncytial? Yeah, th- that's interesting. So we're not seeing any flu patients, right? Mm-hmm. We haven't seen RSV. It's It hasn't locked into the same seasonality. I mean, that that's the prediction. We have yet to see that mm-hmm. happen, right? I and see. that's the whole idea. Um, but we'll see. I mean, you know, we this is new, right? So this is novel, dare I say that. So yes, we'll it's say. new and we will keep covering it, won't we, Daniel? <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I you know, I, I think I'm glad you bring this up because right now we feel like we're at a bit of a lull, but there's still lots of questions. People are still getting diagnosed. Um, people are still hopefully uh, taking the right steps to treat it. Mm-hmm. And uh, there is the uh, predicted increase uh, that we'll see in a few months. So we'll we'll be here ready to talk about it. But Let's get right into it. I don't know if folks throughout the world are familiar with the 4th of July. That's a big celebration here in the United States. So um, this is when people do all kinds of crazy things to demonstrate their their freedom, including eating uh, food that is soaked in mayonnaise and sitting out in the sun for way too many hours. Uh, but I thought I would pick a quotation from uh, one of my favorites, Eleanor Roosevelt. Um, I always love to bring that up because my dad actually met her and was quite impressed by her. Uh, but her quotation, with freedom, comes responsibility. Uh, I feel like Marvel and Spider-Man sort of stole and uh, spun that a little bit, but um, I'm going to jump right into, are you ready for this? Leprosy. Mm. What are we doing talking about leprosy here in the United States? Well, the article Autochthonous Leprosy in the United States was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, And yes, autochthonous meaning people just staying here, not traveling, living in the U.S., getting leprosy. So not sure how many of our listeners have ever seen or or physicians out there, clinicians out there treated cases of leprosy. So uh, a little bit of background is perhaps warranted. Uh, Historically, leprosy was thought to be transmitted exclusively through extended close human to human contact with infection acquired during brief travel considered to be extraordinarily rare, if even possible. In the 1970s, the nine-banded armadillo was identified as a zoonotic reservoir of Mycobacterium leprae, uh, which had been implicated in autochthonous leprosy among persons born or living in the U.S. However, autochthonous leprosy without armadillo exposure has also been reported. Now, a challenge here is there's a really long incubation period for leprosy. Um, Here, uh, this is the report of six cases of leprosy in U.S.-born men, mean age 68.3 years, that were diagnosed between 2017 and 2022 in California. Now, none of these patients had exposure to an infected person. Um, One person reported armadillo exposure more than 50 years earlier. Um, All six patients reported international travel and most reported domestic travel to the U.S. Gulf Coast. The interval between the initial clinical manifestations to diagnosis ranged from months to years. And, um, you know, as mentioned, five of the six patients were older than 65, and all of them had multi bacillary infection. So lots of like teeming with these uh, mycobacteria. What would be the symptom that makes them go to seek medical care? 
Um, a couple of different ways they can present. I, it's great to tell, like one of the times I was being harassed by the uh, medical students when I was working in uh, Kathmandu, where uh, a woman came in and her symptoms were tingling in the fingers, right? So that might be one of the things. And they, Dr. Griffin, what, do you, what should we be thinking about? And then I did my exam and I felt on the nerves, the actual scarred areas, that was leprosy. Mm. Um, also can present as uh, skin patches that are anesthetic. So you see skin patches, but then you touch it with a needle, you poke it with a needle, and the person cannot feel it. Um, so a couple different manifestations. But those, those hopefully you're going to pick it up early when it's just tingling before you've seen any uh, significant changes, maybe just the skin manifestations. And then what do you, how do you treat them? Uh, so the big distinction is posse versus multi bacillary. And so you're going to actually treat them uh, for months with oral agents. And this is something you can treat, something you can cure. All right. You don't have to go to Molokai. <laughs> okay. Yes. Uh, our listeners, maybe we'll Google and figure out why Vincent said that. All right. Mbox, the article, and this is, I, I have kind of an issue with the title here. I'm not sure where the reviewers were, but a systematic review to identify novel clinical characteristics of monkeypox virus infection. Shouldn't that be Mpox? Come on. And Therapeutic and Preventive Strategies to Combat the Virus was published in Archives of Virology. Um, unfortunately, this is behind a paywall, but these are the results of a systematic search in several databases, including PubMed, Google Scholar, Cochrane Library, and the gray literature. What is that? May what is the gray literature? <laughs> <laughs> well, apparently the gray literature spelt either G-R-E-Y or G-R-A-Y are materials and research produced by organizations outside of the traditional commercial or academic publishing um, and distribution channels. And I'll, I'll leave a link for everyone here to the Wikipedia about gray literature. Um, but yes, so we are delving into the gray literature. Maybe we're, are we gray literature? No, we are not gray, no. <laughs> we are not great. And I don't think we should be delving into the gray literature. It sounds sketchy to me. <laughs> Doesn't it sound kind of sketchy? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah it, you know, I have to say it was a very curious, but, but I think the reason I, I bring this up is, um, you know, they, they looked at 21 eligible studies that included 18,275 MPOX cases. A um, couple things that they described was a mean incubation period, about seven days, but an interquartile range of three to 21. Um, and, and the big thing is that when people started first talking about um, MPOX uh, back last last spring into the summer, they always started off with how did MPOX present, you know, 40 years ago in sub-Saharan Africa. And, and now hopefully people are saying, let's teach how MPOX presents now. And so they do actually describe the clinical manifestations we're seeing. So uh, the severe skin lesions. I think you should also look for ones that aren't so severe on the palms, um, in the mouth, in the anogenital regions, proctitis, uh, penile edema, tonsillitis, ocular disease, myalgia, lethargy, sore throat. Um, and then sometimes they have a prodrome, but a lot of times they don't. They just develop these uh, skin lesions right away. Um, and then as we've talked about and they mentioned here, um, there are some, they say fully asymptomatic cases. Um, are they really cases or they're just uh, PCR positive? Um, and they also mention encephalitis and angina. So just want that back on the radar because in a few parts of our country, we're starting to see cases. If you don't think about it, if you don't test for it, um, you're going to miss it. And if you miss it, that might then lead up to onward uh, transmission. All right, polio. Um, I was excited to read this article and then rather concerned. <laughs> um, the article, Two-Year Duration of Immunity of Inactivated Polio Virus Vaccine, a follow-up study in Pakistan in 2020, was recently published in JID. Um, and I was thinking this would be a, a great look into the durability. We might even start to get some, some kinetics of immune responses. Now, as the authors write, unexpectedly, the findings revealed an increase in seroprevalence of of type 2 antibodies from 73.1 to 81.6, one and two years after IPV, respectively. Uh, the increase in type 2 immunity, they say, could result from the intensive transmission of circulating vaccine-derived poliovirus type 2 in Karachi during the second year of IPV administration. Um, and they go on to say this study suggests that the C- VDPV2 outbreak detected in Pakistan um, infected large proportions of children in Karachi. That's surprising because they don't really 
that all they do is look for paralysis, right? And many more kids are infected than get paralyzed. So uh, uh, this is not surprising me that at all that there's extensive circulation of, of this virus there. Yeah. And I mean, here you're basically saying people get, you know, it's a nice figure, actually, if people take a look at this. You know, you see the IPV gets administered. Uh, nine months later, there's another IPV mm -hmm. administration. Um, and, you know, things then go up, they start to come down and boop, then things go up and you're like, OK, so, mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Now I'm going to balance this with the article, Evaluation of Novel Oral Polio Vaccine Type 2, SIA, Impact in a Large Outbreak of Circulating vaccine derived Polio Virus in Nigeria, where we look at the impact of uh, little n, OPV2, on a large outbreak of circulating vaccine derived polio virus type 2 in Nigeria. Uh, the authors let us know that since 2021, over 350 million doses um, of the little n OPV2 <laughs> were used for control of a large outbreak of circulating vaccine-derived poliovirus type 2 in Nigeria. 350 million doses. That is really impressive. Um, they report that the novel oral polio virus type 2 and the monovalent oral polio vaccine type 2 campaigns were highly effective in reducing transmission, um, on average reducing the susceptibility population by 42% and 38% per campaign, respectively. Um, impact was found to vary across areas and between immunization campaigns. Moving into COVID, um, and I, I've got one right up front, which I think we're going to have to have a little discussion about. I, I discussed this with our urgent care docs this uh, this this week, the Wednesday meeting. Um, a lot of really entertaining comments, which I think uh, it's one of the great things. It's one thing to read these studies, but then it's really nice to uh, talk to uh, you know clinicians out there in the trenches, so to speak. So does this really make sense? Well, the article, Performance of Rapid Antigen Tests to Detect Symptomatic and Asymptomatic SARS-CoV-2 Infection was published in Annals of Internal Medicine. Uh, so these are the results of a prospective cohort study where they enrolled participants between October 2021 and January 2022. Participants completed uh, the uh, rapid tests and RT-PCR testing for SARS-CoV-2. Are you ready for this? Every 48 hours for 15 days. Among 154 participants who tested positive for SARS-CoV-2, 97 were asymptomatic, 57 had symptoms at infection onset. Serial testing with the rapid test twice 48 hours apart resulted in an aggregate sensitivity of 93.4% among symptomatic participants on different days past the index PCR positivity. Um, the aggregated sensitivity um, among the asymptomatic Folks was lower at 62.7, but improved to 79% with testing three times at 48-hour intervals. Um, and I really like figure three. Um, so just to remind folks that have been listening for a while, uh, remember those CT values, those cycle threshold values? This is how many times do I have to run that PCR machine before I finally get a positive test? Um, you know, the, the people that are acutely ill were running that, you know, maybe 15, 20 times, picking those folks up. Now, once someone either starts to get better or very early, or in some cases, we're actually seeing folks that um, have had a recent infection or recent vaccination, um, we might never get really high levels of uh, viral RNA. We might have to run that out to 30, 35, 40. Um, nice thing here about figure four is they give us the sensitivity for symptomatic and asymptomatic CT value relative to the predicted probability of having a positive rapid test. Um, so basically, if that CT value is 20 or less, if they are quote unquote teeming with viral <laughs> RNA, <laughs> you're picking them up all the time. Once you start to get to about 25, um, the sensitivity starts to go down. Once you get to particularly 30, asymptomatic, it really drops off. But even 30 with a symptomatic person, you're still doing an over 80% sensitivity. Um, 
couple of comments mm-hmm. I got from the clinicians on the call yesterday. Um, one was, so Dr. Griffin, what about those expired tests from two years ago? <laughs> what about those tests that were sitting out on the doorstep for hours until the person finally got home baking in the sun? Um, what about those tests that actually have two lines and they show it to us and say it's a negative test? So, you know, this this is an I, more of an ideal world. And I, I think the takeaway from here is that folks that are teeming with viral RNA, symptomatic, great sensitivity um, if the test is not expired and actually working properly and performed properly. So a a positive test is very reliable. A negative test, as we've been saying, you want to repeat that um, to see. Um, And if uh, the person is symptomatic and qualifies for treatment, you may want to actually jump on with a molecular test as the CDC recommends. All right. Love that figure though. All right. COVID active vaccination. Um, Now, this I think is a good one, and and we'll hopefully spend a little time sort of drilling in this. But the article, Effectiveness of the Coronavirus Disease 2019 Bivalent Vaccine, was published in the June Volume 10, Issue 6, issue of OFID, Open Form Infectious Disease. Um, I think they should have right in the title, when you say effectiveness, Mm. what are you talking about, right? Effectiveness to do what? what? Yep. Yep. So this is a study that one really needs to read carefully. Um, Otherwise, you can just use this to sort of feed any confirmation bias that you choose. In this study, they included employees of the Cleveland Clinic, um, where the bivalent COVID-19 vaccine first became available. Uh, The cumulative incidence of COVID-19 over the following 26 weeks was examined, right? So this is COVID-19. This is incidence of infection. We're not talking here about hospitalization, death. Protection provided by vaccination, analyzed as a time-dependent correlate, was evaluated um, with change in dominant circulating lineages over time, accounted for by time-dependent coefficients. The analysis was adjusted for the pandemic phase when the last prior COVID-19 episode occurred and the number of prior vaccine doses. Um, Here, they're going to look at over 51,000 employees. COVID is going to occur in 4,427 during this study, so about 8.7%. Now, what was the estimated vaccine effectiveness protection against infection. Um, During the BA.45 dominant period, 29%. During the BQ dominant period, 20%. And now in the time we currently are in, during the XBB dominant phase, decreased risk was not found. So no reduction in infection added by getting a booster um, during the XBB dominant phase. Um, the, and the booster is bivalent, correct? So this is the bivalent. So this is that, mm. yep, yeah, the so ancestral, ancestral plus, plus the plus BA45. Four five. Four yeah. Five, yeah, okay. Yeah. Not surprising, right? Yeah, I think this is important for people to keep on their radar, right? So, you know, someone comes in now and they say, oh, hey, I haven't gotten that bivalent vaccine. Should I get it? Should I wait till the fall? I think this gives you the answer. This says, listen, um, I don't think we have compelling science that we're going to get any neutralizing antibodies, that we're going to be able to offer any reduction in your chance of getting infected. And the other side, which I think is really reassuring, is that we tend to have durability with protection against severe disease. Um, so we'll we'll hopefully have a discussion uh, come October when we start to get some data on the updated boosters and talk a little bit about for whom it makes sense, what does the science tell us. But in the meantime, Daniel, you would say if you are at risk, then you should take Paxlovid. So that, I think that's the biggest thing. And, and let's move right into that because that that's the whole issue, right? Like hopefully the majority of people that are listening to us um, have been have been vaccinated if they were able to do that. Um, but what if you get infected? Does it matter? Unvaccinated, vaccinated? Does Paxlovid still make a difference? So we'll move right into the COVID early viral upper respiratory non-hypoxic phase. That first week, you test positive. Maybe it was a rapid test. Maybe it was molecular. Well, the article, article oral nermotrelvir and ritonavir for COVID-19 in vaccinated, non-hospitalized adults ages 18 to 50 was recently published in CID. Um, So 
The science is rather clear that Paxlovid is highly effective in the unvaccinated when they have risk factors such as age over 50, other medical comorbidities. Um, also compelling science that we can reduce the risk of progression in the vaccinated when they have risk factors such as age over 50, medical comorbidities. But what about Paxlovid for COVID-19 in vaccinated adults 18 to 50? So here, the investigators generated two propensity-matched cohorts of 2,547 patients from an 86,119-person cohort assembled from the TriNetX database. Um, then they did a comparative retrospective cohort study. Uh, patients in one cohort received Paxlovid, and patients in the matched control cohort did not. Um, they looked at a composite of all-cause emergency department visits, hospitalization, and mortality. So basically, interaction with this level of the healthcare system. Uh, the composite outcome was detected in 4.9% of the Paxlovid, 7% of the non-treated, um, indicating about a 30% relative risk reduction. Um, now, interesting the different numbers needed to treat. So I actually pasted into the show notes today, table three, which I think is worth looking at. Um, so let's look at, let's say what qualified this individual was cardiovascular disease. And by cardiovascular disease, what, what do we mean? So hypertension, um, hyperlipidemia, um, ischemic heart disease, atrial fibrillation. Um, the number needed to treat to prevent someone from ending up in the ER or the hospital was only 30. If the person had cancer, the number needed to treat was 45. If they had both cancer and a cardiovascular uh, risk, it was 16. Um, if this is someone who has been in the ER in the last three years, only 19 needed to treat. Um, you know, a couple of questions. Um, what about long COVID? What about other outcomes? Um, I think it would be nice to to know because a lot of people say, you know what, I just my risk of ending up in the ER, ending up in the hospital is really pretty low. Should I bother? Should I go through all this effort? So, well, for these numbers are not bad. In other words, except for the no ER visit, hospitalization in the prior three, so basically healthy people, right? Yeah, and I think that's really where we get. You, you don't need to give this to everyone, right? If someone's healthy. In this 18 to 50 year old, they yeah. don't have comorbidities. Yeah. Um, you know, you don't need to give this to everyone. Um, yeah. All right. Number two, right, as we've talked about remdesivir, but, you know, continues to be an issue. There's no like website you can jump on and say, hey, where's the closest outpatient three day IV remdesivir to me? Maybe it's a call to action. Um, malnupiravir, right? Thor's hammer. Uh, convalescent plasma for that particular immunocompromised uh, patient. And the biggest thing, let's not do harmful and useless things. Daniel, at the ASV, I said, at lunch one day, I sat across from a guy who had a coffee mug. It said Team Malnupiravir on it. He, <laughs> he, he worked at EIDD, the Emory uh, Emory. Uh, what is it called? Uh, Emory uh, Infectious Diseases Drug. Uh, oh, come on. I got to figure this out. What is EID? Yeah, no, that's where they started with the flu work down there Emory, at Emory, right? Emory Institute yeah. for Drug Development. Yeah, he works yeah. there. And he said, they have more things coming out. Good stuff. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, this is one that, you know, I, I don't know if our listeners know, but for a while I was doing a lot of um, remote consultation for the uh, refugee camps um, mm -hmm. over in um, sort of the Bangladeshi refugees, um, the Myanmar refugees. And um, it really is a great drug in a situation like that because you don't have to worry about drug-drug interactions. You're taking it twice a day. You don't have to worry about um, renal adjustments. So it's it's a nice um, it's a nice option in, in certain settings. But he did admit that it didn't work so great. Yeah, that's that's the only that's the only downside, dare I say. <laughs> it doesn't work so great. Yeah. All right. Well, what about folks that progress? And this does happen. I got a couple of folks in the hospital right now who uh, got admitted second week, um, oxygen saturations less than 94%. Um, so 
number one, right? We've talked about this and let's keep our order sets up to date. Dexamethasone, six milligrams a day times six days, not seven, not 10. We've learned more six milligrams times about six days. So time to update those order sets and recommendations. Uh, number two, anticoagulation, a uh, number of organizations giving guidelines out. A little sad today for me, it was our last meeting of the American Society of Hematology guideline panel. So uh, met some wonderful people over the last few years, but they've got some guidelines guidelines. Um, and I love the way the guidelines sort of point out, this is the population that's studied. Keep that in mind when you're looking at your patient and how those uh, risks compare. Uh, pulmonary support, we've talked about all the issues there, proning, trying to avoid intubation when possible. Um, remdesivir, if we're still in the first 10 days before they've ended up on a ventilator. Immune modulation in some situations, tocilizumab. Um, and let's move into late phase PASC long COVID. A um, couple nice studies here to wrap us out. The first is actually posted as a preprint on Med Archive, Genome Wide Association Study of Long COVID. Um, here, the authors start by commenting that infections can lead to persistent or long term symptoms and diseases such as shingles after varicella zoster, cancers after human papillomavirus, or rheumatic fever after streptococcal infections. Similarly, they're getting a parallel here. Infection by SARS-CoV-2 can result in long COVID, a condition characterized by symptoms of fatigue, pulmonary cognitive dysfunction. So here are the investigators um, let us know that they leveraged the COVID-19 host genetics initiative to perform a genome-wide association study for long COVID, including up to 6,450 long COVID cases and 1,093,995 population controls from 24 studies across 16 countries. They identified the first genome-wide significant association for long COVID at the FOXP4 locus. Uh, FOXP4 has been previously associated with COVID-19 severity, uh, lung function, cancers. A really nice Manhattan plot in figure 2A and figure 2B breaks it down by the different studies. Um, I don't know how many folks have looked at a Manhattan plot, but um, I spent a little time in the genetics universe doing GWAS stuff. Um, but the idea here is that they're picking up a change that is associated with Fox P4 expression in the lungs, um, expression analysis of the lung and cell type specific single cell sequencing analysis showed Fox P4 expression in both alveolar cell types and immune cells of the lung. Um, little background, Fox P4 belongs to the subfamily uh, P of the Forkhead box transcription factory family genes um, expressed in various tissues, including the lungs and the gut. Um, moreover, it's highly expressed in mucus secreting cells of the stomach and intestines, as well as naive B uh, natural killer memory T reg cells and required for normal T cell memory function following infection. So basically, if you have a certain change in the Fox P4 gene, you may be predisposed to long COVID. We think it may be right in the regulation part of FOXP4, at least what I was looking through. So it may not be so much a modification okay. of FOXP4 itself, but it may be a modification mm -hmm. of the expression sequence preceding it. So, All right. And I, I really like this one. I thought this was really um, an interesting way to look at this. So, you know, we've been talking for a while about folks have long COVID um, and then they get a vaccine dose and then a certain percent of them get better. So. The article, Vaccination Ameliorates Cellular Inflammatory Responses in SARS-CoV-2 Breakthrough Infections, was published in JID. And the reason I like this is people sort of had this idea, well, a vaccine is just going to boost your immune response. And, and I like to think a vaccination is going to correct your immune response. So here the authors conducted a prospective study of peripheral blood cellular immune responses to SARS-CoV-2 infection in 21 vaccinated patients and 97 unvaccinated patients stratified based on disease severity. Um, they enrolled 118 persons with SARS-CoV-2 infection. Compared to unvaccinated patients, vaccinated patients with breakthrough infections had a higher percentage of antigen-presenting monocytes, mature monocytes, functionally competent T-cells, and mature neutrophils, and lower percentages of activated T-cells, activated neutrophils, and immature B-cells. 
So this whole idea, why, why could vaccination uh, protect you against long COVID? Now, these differences widen with increased uh, disease severity in unvaccinated patients. And longitudinal analysis showed that cellular activation decreased over time, but it persisted in unvaccinated patients with mild disease at eight month follow-up. And they have a really nice graphical abstract. We can see all the different cell types and the surface markers. That's an interesting result. Very interesting. Yeah. All right. And I think I'm going to wrap us up here with our last study. The article, High Incidence of Autonomic Dysfunction and Postural Orthostatic Tachycardia Syndrome in Patients with Long COVID, Implications for Management and Healthcare Planning, published in the American Journal of Medicine. Um, basically, the big thing I want people to take away from this um, is they did a number of, of tests um, and basically saw um, a significant amount of autonomic dysfunction and postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome in these folks. Um, the big thing is if you don't test for this, if you don't look for this, you're not going to find it. Um, something as simple as the NASA lean test might be a way to approach this. Um, in his study, they mentioned a number of different ways of looking at this and detecting this. And I'm going to wrap it up there with um, no one is safe until everyone is safe. Uh, we're in the last month. We're in July, the last month of our Foundation International Medical Relief of Children fundraiser. Um, we're hoping to get to our goal. We're not quite there yet. So uh, uh, thanks for everyone who's helped so far. But everyone else, stop what you're doing. Pull over to the side of the road. Go to ParasitesWithoutBorders.com. Click the donate button and help us get to our goal. I have a question about that last paper, POTS. Yes. It's also something you see in MECFS patients, correct? It is. It is. So that's interesting that there are two common symptoms in these two uh, different diseases or syndromes, right? So now you're going to get yourself into trouble. I don't know if you know about this, Vincent, but there's actually a lot of, uh, <laughs> yeah, like you never did it before, but no. So there's a lot of controversy, right? About like sometimes people long COVID feel like, oh, the ME CFS folks are stealing our narrative. Yeah. Um, you know, is it, is, are there commonalities? Um, uh, it's really an interesting challenge. Um, uh, David Tuller and I, we've been emailing a little bit here and there. We talked a while back. Um, some of the stuff I think, um, you know, if you are familiar with the MACFS literature, that can actually help you interpret some of these things. Like we talked about pacing, David and I, where, you know, subjectively people felt better. But if you looked at the, uh, uh, where they actually monitor how much activity they're doing, I'm not sure you were seeing the increase in activity you hoped for. The cognitive behavioral therapy, again, mm -hmm. people felt less fatigued. They felt like they were able to do more. But if you actually monitored, they weren't really doing much more. So I think that you can learn from a lot of the mistakes in the MECFS literature. Uh, um, hopefully, uh, that'll help us. And I am hoping there is some commonality of mechanism here so that when we help one population, that we can get some help for the other as well. Yeah, I think if you'd say they're both the same, then people get mad at you, right? <laughs> and I understand yeah. that. We're not but, saying that. We're not saying that. <laughs> they're, they're commonalities which can help you understand both, right? That's the whole point. Like POTS clearly is in a fraction of both mm -hmm. patients. So you you have to use that to to drive your understanding. That's all I'm saying. Okay. <laughs> don't, get, don't get me in trouble. <laughs> okay. I did get an email about pacing because remember last time I said Tuller has been writing about pacing. And uh, someone wrote and said pacing is actually good. But I wrote Tuller and he said, well, it's not really a therapy, right? It's just a way of – I think – yeah. Yeah, I think that's the tough thing. Like if you if you look at this actigography that they do where you actually able to monitor, you know, this is what David comments about. Uh, they had that data, right? So they said, oh, look, pacing, people who did pacing, they felt better. People who stuck with pacing had less fatigue. Um, and they had the data on the – Mm -hmm. And they said, you know, and they, and they should have published that, I think, from full disclosure, say people are feeling better. There's a subjective improvement. But by the way, we're not seeing the improvement in performance that you would expect to go along with that. I mean, just full disclosure makes sense. All right. It's time for your questions for Daniel. You can send them to Daniel at microbe.tv. James writes. Uh, all right. So many people came across this article, which uh, is saying there is a rare link between COVID vaccines and uh, long COVID, which they're calling long vax. Many, many listeners uh, wrote in about it and they want to know what you think about it. 
Yeah, I, I saw the article. I actually thought it was a good article. Um, and, um, you know, I, I have a couple patients who develop problems after the vaccine, right? Um, and some of those patients have what seems very similar to what my patients who develop problems after COVID developed. Um, Akiko and Harlan Crumshold up at um, Yale have actually a study called Listen. Um, and I sort of like the, the name of the study because what they've said is, listen, if you had a vaccination and you started to develop problems afterwards. We're interested in hearing from you. We're interested in trying to understand this. Um, and, and I think that that's, that's really positive. I mean, as scientists, you don't, you, you don't just say, oh, we don't want to hear. Oh my gosh, you're going you're gonna to pull me into the wrong realm with this. And actually, a couple of my patients who have developed problems, they say, oh, you sort of have to be careful online because if you mention this, out of the woodworks comes sort of this anti-science um, movement. And, and these folks are, are not necessarily anti-science. They're just someone who got a vaccination, problems afterwards they're trying to figure out what's going on um so yeah I, I think it's uh i think it's it's okay to have this discussion yeah it's just the problem is then somebody like rfk jr will say see i told you vaccines are no good yeah it's really it's it's unfortunate yeah and do do we know that these people didn't have previously an undetected asymptomatic infection that could have influenced the response yeah i mean the, these are the challenges right is that like bad things happen, right? I mean, people, what, what was it? The one, one of the vaccine studies where like there were a higher incidence of children swallowing marbles in the vaccine group. I think the vaccine was triggering marble swallowing. So it's, it's hard to know. And that's why I think it's good to study these yeah, folks to look and say like, you know, did you just, you know, get the onset of an issue and the vaccine happened to precede it or was it really triggered? I, I think there's a Paul Offit story where the uh, the mother is not sure about vaccines and they're having this discussion. And then the, the child has a seizure. The child hasn't had a vaccine yet. And, you know, his sort of story is, oh, my gosh, if they had just received a vaccine sure. like five minutes earlier, instead of us having this discussion, then it would have been, you know, related. So, um, yeah, th this these are challenging things that we need to understand. But this is a very rare condition. So. People should not. I, I think, yeah, I think that's what makes it a challenge is that this is not like we're seeing, you know, I mean, you, you hear some of these people as millions of people, you know, will all be dead by 2022. We're, we're here. These are incredibly safe, effective vaccines. And I think as an email I wrote in one time, there's no side effect from the vaccine that even compares to the, the outcomes that we yeah. see post COVID infection. Uh, Joanne writes, would you give me your medical opinion on getting the XBB booster for a 65-year-old woman with HO, breast cancer, remission, asthma, second-degree heart block, mobits, mobitis one who is normotensive, non-diabetic, and not obese? Wow. Okay. Yeah. No, this is this is good. So we've talked a little bit over time for that, that durable protection against disease, right? Ending up in the ER, hospital, um, or worse. Um, three doses it seems to be durable. Mm -hmm. uh, for a period of time, we just discussed some of the literature, you could get a little bit of a reduction, 20-29% um, reduction in risk of even getting infected for a short period of time prior to the XBB circulation. Right now, I'm not sure that we can offer much with the current vaccine. So it's going to be really interesting. It's like stay tuned for the data we get September, October, um, because we'll come back with the answer. Um, do those updated vaccines produce a significant level of mucosal neutralizing antibodies? Can we offer that extra boost for a few months? An individual like this, ideally, you'd like to avoid infection at all. Probably the most important is if they do get infected, you want to jump in because we know that the medications can significantly reduce the risk. Joyce writes, I really appreciate the responses from both Russ and Dr. Griffin about the issues with Paxlovid and antiarrhythmic medications. I've tried to find locations offering remdesivir in the Phoenix, Arizona area, but that information does not appear to be readily available. I'm wondering how a layperson can find a location offering these infusions or must one consult a physician to even find that out? Yeah, this, this is yeah, this is a challenge. I'm glad you bring it up. I remember when we were in the days of the monoclonal antibodies, and a lot of organizations jumped in. Survivor Corps actually set up a website. Got COVID, you go there, you put in your uh, zip code, and helped you get to the place. Uh, Remdesivir, really nothing has been set up like that. And I think as we discussed, there's certain people where it's a really a problem with drug-drug interactions and something like remdesivir would be a great option. Um, a little bit of a vacuum here. So maybe some of our listeners are thinking, hey, they want to fill that vacuum and provide a resource. 
Jen writes, I'm a family practice physician in Ohio. On prior TWIV, you commented that three COVID vaccines are sufficient for the general population. For patients over 65 who are immune compromised, what are the recommendations? I don't want to recommend unnecessary vaccines and would like data that additional boosters beyond the three are preventing more morbidity and mortality, if possible, not just increasing titers. Is there a new vaccine coming out in the fall? Should I wait to give additional boosters if there is a new one coming? Yeah, uh, this is this is great. And we're just sort of repetition um, is good here. Come October, November, we are hoping to have an updated um, XBB type vaccine. Be really interesting to see what variants are circulating at that point in time and to see if we're actually going to be able to uh, to have the science uh, to uh, support going forward with the vaccines. Um, fingers crossed. Uh, we've got a game plan in place, but we'll have to see. And she also asks for measles. Can you ident- can you clarify if checking immunity titers should be done for certain patients traveling or all people as we are seeing measles in the U.S.? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we talked about this last time. There's there's measles out there. So, um, yeah, you, you really basically want to make sure people are up to date with their with their measles. We haven't really gotten to the point yet where we're checking serology on all our travelers. Uh, actually, if anything, it was a recent CDC, um, I think it was MMWR, where they just bemoaned how few people even get pre-travel guidance. So that may be something where we have to start including that as a benefit. Uh, but, yeah, at this point... Make sure everyone's vaccinated. And finally, Christina writes, I'm a chemist, not a virologist. Isn't that something from Star Trek, Daniel? (laughs) I think it's like, I'm a doctor. (laughs) I'm an engineer, not a, I'm a doctor, not, I don't remember, something like that. Anyway, (laughs) I was wondering if you could talk a bit about shingles vaccine. I just received my first dose. Wanted to know your thoughts on it. I've known people who got shingles. It seemed to incapacitate him. So I'm hoping to avoid it. I had chicken pox as a teen. Yeah. So across the board, anyone out there who's 50 and above, just to let you know, you got a 50-50 chance that you're going to end up with shingles if you don't do something about that. Uh, the Shingrix vaccine, it's a protein-based, um, it's like the Novavax shingles vaccine, um, has over 90% efficacy in reducing your risk of shingles, of the clinical disease. So it's 97% in a healthy population. Even people who are immunocompromised, you're still seeing over 80% efficacy. So incredibly effective vaccine. Um, there is a little bit of reactogenicity. So you get your one shot, you may not feel so great. So do it on a Friday or a Saturday. So you got the next day to uh, uh, sort of get over that. Uh, the recommendation you get the next shot sort of one to six months later. We're already getting like high 90% efficacy just four weeks later. Um, yeah, most of us with a background in immunology might say you might want to wait three to six months, you know, get that second shot, get get the best germinal center um, boost you can there. Um, but no, recommended across the board. And as you say, yes, shingles is a horrible disease, can be incredibly painful and debilitating. Um, yeah. So, Daniel, I had shingles when I was recording TWIV number eight. Wow. <laughs> and I know oh this because TWIV number eight was on herpes viruses and we talked about it. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, th- just last year, I got my Shingrix because I could get it again, right? Uh, yes. And, and that's the thing. Even after an episode of Shingles, this has been studied. Go ahead. Get your vaccinations. That's TWIV Weekly Clinical Update with Dr. Daniel Griffin. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. And everyone, be safe. <laughs>